Welcome to the Damascus Road Podcast. On the road to Damascus, Paul had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was changed forever. That is what we hope and pray for here. Now, on to this week's episode. Now, though it has been several years since I have had to do it, I do have quite a bit of experience going to court. Now, that has almost exclusively been over some sort of traffic ticket, including uh, speeding and going 18 miles per hour over, uh, for reckless driving, by falling asleep behind the wheel, and even uh, once for parking in my girlfriend's driveway. That was a weird one. Uh, But my experience in court has taught me that it is always worth it to go to court to challenge the ticket and appear before a judge. Even if you are 100% guilty, as I have been uh, for some of those violations, they will always just about reward your efforts and allow you to plead down to a lower fine and penalty. Sometimes the judge uh, won't even show up and they'll just wave your tickets here in and out Uh, so fast that you don't even have to pay for parking. Now, I will give a disclaimer, recognizing that we have a soon-to-be driver here. Just don't get the tickets. Just don't speed. (laughs) The best bet is just to avoid the tickets altogether. So just, that's for Zane. Um, (laughs) Thinking about that as I say that. Um, Now, unfortunately, I cannot say the same is true of my experience in civil court. Now, I didn't think I'd be able to share this with you, But many years ago, I filmed a pilot for a courtroom show like Judge Judy, and though it never aired, I've obtained the footage, and I can share it with you now. Real cases, real people, Judge JT. You're about to enter the courtroom of Judge JT Brooks. The people are real. The cases are real. The rulings are final. This is Judge JT. All rise for the Honorable Judge J.T. You may be seated. Now tell me, why are you here today? My roommate, Casey White, has been stealing from me for these past six months, and I believe I can prove it. It's not true at all. Okay, so can you prove this? Can you bring forth some evidence for me? He he just stole my necklace! Well, to be honest, it looks better on him than it does on you, so I need evidence now. He just he just stole my belt! What? Okay, I'm done with this. This is weird. I saw a bumper sticker today on my way to work. It said judge not. So I'm not gonna judge today. But your honor, it's your job to judge. You You're a judge! Not today, Henry. Not today. He stole- how'd you steal my hat? He's wearing it now! What did I tell you? Judge not, court dismissed! Stole my shirt! And my girlfriend! I will still do. Hey, baby. Judge J.T. To our younger uh, members of the community, I know you may be wondering, why did we stop? Why have we made, like, videos in a while? Well, maybe after that, plus, like, five more Judge J.T. videos, that might answer the question of why we stopped. (laughs) Um, Now, I don't know. There was obviously no justice to be had in the courtroom of Judge J.T., Uh, But at least we can all acknowledge the production value was great. (laughs) You have to admit it. Now, whether it plays out on a daytime courtroom drama or is about a roommate blatantly stealing all your stuff or, you know, something else entirely, we all still have conflict in our lives. And the question that we face is how do we solve it? How do we deal with that conflict? We could deal with it directly, but we fear that will be messy and difficult. Because on the one hand, it could lead to a positive outcome, it could lead to changed behavior, forgiveness, reconciliation, and all that jazz. On the other hand, we could end up just feeling even more hurt and more wronged. In which case, going to court, that sounds pretty appealing. Because then someone else is there who has to make the judgment and who will enforce it if we win the case. 
we don't have to get as messy if a judge could just mediate and solve the dispute for us. But of course, if we follow that course of action, it's probably not good for the relationship. I can't imagine taking someone to court strengthens a friendship. And of course, there's no guarantee that we will like the outcome, as I obviously did not in the courtroom of Judge JT. I mean, what if we lost the case? What if the judge rules against us? So what about like a third course of action, and we just ignore everything? Let's try that. I'm sure that'll work. Because on resolve conflict, that doesn't lead to tension in our relationships or anxiety in our hearts or unrest in our souls. Not at all. But of course, that's exactly what it does lead to. Try avoiding dealing with a conflict long enough, and we will only discover even more problems to deal with, not less. So as we have all summer, let's turn to 1 Corinthians and consider what Paul has to say. I invite you to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, because that's where we will live this morning as we explore Paul's instruction to the church in Corinth regarding dealing with conflict amongst one another in the church and going to court over it. So let's dive in, and let me start by reading the whole passage. When one of you has a dispute with another believer, how dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you're going to judge the world, can't you decide even these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. If you have legal disputes about such matters, why go to outside judges who are not respected by the church? I am saying this to shame you. Isn't there anyone in all the church who is wise enough to decide these issues? But instead, one believer sues another right in front of unbelievers. Even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. Why not just accept the injustice and leave it to that? Why, why not let yourselves be cheated? Instead, you yourselves are the ones who do wrong and cheat even your fellow believers. This passage is a bit strange, and it doesn't really seem to help much in our problem of dealing with our problems. I mean, when we first read the passage, it raises a few questions. First, what is that bit where we will judge the world? And then there's the part about judging angels. What is that about? Those certainly raise some questions for me. Now, finally, and perhaps the most troubling part is that in Paul's conclusion, does he encourage us to simply accept injustice? For me, it's hard to move on until we take the time, take the time to consider what Paul really means by these few parts of the passage. So first question, we will judge the world. What does this mean? Perhaps when you read this, you picture a future where Christians have filled all the roles in our judicial system, and it's a promise of Christians establishing themselves in the systems of our world. Well, no, I, I, don't, I do not believe that's what Paul really means. Instead, it's more reasonable that this someday that Paul is writing about is not a day that we can imagine in our timeline, but at the end of all time. It's an eschatological claim. That is, it, it pertains to the end times. And we read promises like this across scripture, such as in Daniel chapter 7, when Daniel shares some of these apocalyptic visions that he has of the end times. And again in Revelation, when John details his own visions of the end time. Both of those describe how the empires and powers of the world will oppose God and God's people until, as Daniel writes, until the ancient one, the most high, came and judged in favor of his holy people. Then the time arrived for the holy people to take over the kingdom. And now Paul is reminding the church of these messages, that the, that the church, um, that God's kingdom will reign, not the powers of the world, but God. And that we will be a part of that kingdom, united with God's will and in our proper place as stewards of God's creation, just as we are commissioned to be in Genesis 1. This idea of judging the world is a vision of restoration of God's intention for humanity, not achieved outside the kingdom of heaven. And we answer the next question about we will judge the angels kind of the same way. Now, I've tried to research what Paul means exactly by this phrase, and I'll be honest, I haven't really found a clear answer. But that's also not quite the point. 
Because when Paul says, you will judge angels, his audience understood. It meant something to them, even if it is unclear to us. They understood what Paul was saying. And for us, that's more important. Um, that's more important. And what matters to us is the point that Paul is making about our authority and our ability to judge and resolve our own disputes, then, then it's like a theological claim about angels. What it does mean is ultimately kind of the same as his reminder that we will judge the world. Paul is commenting on our intended place in the order of creation and of God's intention to restore all things to God's kingdom. Paul's point is this. If God intends us to hold such positions of stewardship and authority above creation, both material and spiritual, well, then surely we can handle disputes and conflicts within our own church community. It's an encouragement. That is our takeaway from it. That is our encouragement. We are capable of, we are commissioned for resolving our conflict. We do not need the courts of the world. We do not need outside mediators. We have the love and grace of God and the unity and wisdom of the church community. If one day God will trust us with such authority, then surely we can go to one another and work through the most difficult conversations and resolve the most dis divisive disputes. And as for our third question, um, is Paul encouraging us to accept injustice? He writes that it would be better to accept injustice than to take a fellow Christian to court. That sounds like a hard pill to swallow amid modern headlines of abuses of power, of sexual abuses, of harassment, and great harm inflicted by people within the broader church upon one another. Not only by members of churches, but also by leaders, by elders, by ministers and pastors. And we do not have to search far to find a story where a church, instead of holding the abuser accountable, protects them and fails to stand up for those who have been wounded and hurt. The failure of churches to uphold justice within their own communities is one of the most damaging failures of the church. It is the cause of so many to abandon their faith and their relationship with God. Because who wants to accept the grace of God when many use that grace, to do a use that grace as a license to do terrible things? And that is the hard reality as we examine God's church, as we examine the global church, the body of Christ, honestly. In light of this, it is hard to accept Paul's assertion to accept injustice rather than take a fellow Christian to court when Christians cause one another harm that goes unchecked and unchallenged. But that isn't what Paul is saying. We should not permit injustice to continue just because it's happening within the church. And instead, for understanding Paul, we need to first consider the biblical and the cultural context of his writing. Now, first consider the biblical context. Paul is encouraging the church to judge the sin of those inside the church. That is literally what's happening right around the passage we are reading today. Like, let's just step back to chapter 5, one chapter before, which we studied earlier this summer when Caleb came to visit. And when, if you remember, he preached on how we must deal with the sin inside the church because sin has a harmful, pervasive influence that spreads and infects all around it. Remember, Paul was disgusted with the Corinthians because they were celebrating, not just permitting, they were celebrating the sexual sin within their community. And Paul challenges their self-perception of being so progressive and so loving because they had accepted a man in the church who was having sexual relationships with his stepmother. Paul warns them not to permit sin because sin has such a harmful influence if allowed to continue. Chapter 5 closes with Paul instructing the Corinthians that it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it is certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. This is immediately preceding those instructions he gave on dealing with disputes with one another that we read before. Before Paul tells them to settle matters within, matters within the church and not in secular courts, is this direct instruction to deal with the sin of the other members of the church community. Allowing abuse to continue within the church is not following Paul's writing, but is directly disobeying it. And this is further reinforced when we consider the cultural context. Remember, we're discussing Roman courts, not modern courts. We cannot just slap Paul's instruction on our modern judicial system, but instead place it within Paul's historical context in Rome. 
When reading this passage, don't imagine our system. Instead, understand Roman courts were different. And one thing about them was they were very public. They had many participants and onlookers watching. And the ability to win over the crowd could easily influence the outcome. Advocates could come in and assist the prosecution or the defense and regularly use that as an opportunity to show off with elaborate speeches, something where they could gain honor, they could gain status and power for themselves. So there's a lot of room for corruption in that system, favoring the rich and powerful who could pay for those best advocates. Um, or even they could bribe judges, and there's room for that as well. The reality was that it was not a very just system. Valerius Maximus, a first century Latin writer and author of a collection of historical antidotes, he gives us an idea of how the injustice of that system was apparent. And he's writing just one generation before Paul that the laws are like spider's webs. Just as spider's webs catch the weaker creatures but let the stronger ones through, so the humble and poor are restricted by the laws, but the rich and the powerful are not bound by them. Considering this is the cultural context of Paul, well, then maybe we can, accept, we can understand that, well, Paul says it would be better to accept the injustice than go to court with a fellow Christian. He's not setting up like a duality of like one system leads to justice and one doesn't. He's certainly not, and he's certainly not advocating for injustice to go unchecked by the church. In an already unjust system, Paul is saying it would be better just to accept the injustice than to engage with this broken system. Not that that is the best option, it's just the better of those two. It's like trying to argue with a child. Once at a Miller birthday party where pepperoni pizza was running out but the cheese pizza was plentiful, I observed Catherine take a slice of the pepperoni and then remove every piece of the pepperoni from her slice. So I asked her, Catherine, why did you do that? And she explained, well, I, didn't, I don't want the pepperoni. So then I asked, well, why didn't you just take the cheese pizza then? Because I wanted pepperoni pizza, she responded. Now, now it was at that point, I realized that I had lost this argument simply by engaging with a child. And children are not bound by logic or reason as I am. They don't follow the same rules in an argument. So it's impossible to win. Likewise, Paul is telling the church to not even engage with a system that's not bound by justice and God, as the church was. So to even take another believer to court was already defeat. It was spending time and resources and broadcasting the church's struggles to a, to a hostile culture. So in that system, it would be better to be cheated or to accept injustice, but that doesn't mean that that best option is not to then confront it directly ourselves. And that is what is Paul, that's what Paul is doing. He is asserting that the church should be more trustworthy for enacting justice for the poor and disadvantaged members of their own community. And we should always seek peace and seek restorative justice as a task of the church. But we are called to do that ourselves and not to just pass that responsibility off to the world. Again, God calls us to be stewards of creation and co-heirs of Christ. So what does this mean for us? It means God created us to, to reign over creation. And God calls us to be more just than the courts of the world. Thus, when we have conflict with one another, we should resolve disputes directly in our own lives. We are called and commissioned to do that. We are equipped to do that. This means we don't avoid them. The Corinthians avoided settling disputes by passing that responsibility off to a Roman court, which obviously angered Paul greatly. We avoid our conflicts by other means. We do it by ignoring the issue and pretending it doesn't exist, or we go off to others instead of that person that we are in conflict with. And we're not trying to seek wisdom from others or guidance for, or help processing that problem, but instead we're just complaining and venting and pushing that outward. We're making others deal with our conflict instead of uh, deal with it instead of ourselves. We're just passing off our frustration and hurt rather than really addressing it ourselves. We also avoid conflict by hiding behind technology. 
and trying to resolve something via text or social media. Like the Corinthians, we too can avoid dealing with our conflicts in many different ways. But in doing so, as Paul says, we do wrong and cheat even your fellow believers. And in, in avoiding conflict, we just inflict more damage and more hurt. But Paul is not telling us that we are on our own, but is instead encouraging us to solve issues within and with our church community. Sometimes we need help with conflict. We may need, see, may need someone to help us sort through it. We may need, may need someone to help mediate the conflict. Paul is clear that the church must be capable of this. Isn't there anyone in all the church who is wise enough to decide these issues? The church, that is our community, has wisdom that we can lean into. So take advantage of the collective wisdom of your church community. Just make sure as you do so that the goal is to move towards resolution and peace. Because wisdom seeking can be another delay tactic to addressing conflict as we constantly seek help, but never then actually act upon it. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus declares, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Because we are to make peace. We are to work for it. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but it is the presence of wholeness. And Paul and Jesus both teach us to seek it in our church, in our relationships, and in our world. This morning, I invite you to ask yourself, do you have anyone you are not at peace with? What relationships in your life, in this community, lack wholeness? Maybe you have been hurt by someone and need to address it. Maybe you are, you are aware that you have hurt someone else and you need to apologize. And maybe it's both because often relationships are complicated and two-sided. Maybe you have tried to avoid a difficult conversation using text or using other people and you're just kind of putting it off instead of talking to that person directly. As Jesus teaches, blessed are the peacemakers. Let's make peace. During reflection, consider if there is a relationship where you need to make peace. Ask God to reveal it to you. Then give it to God and consider what your next step is. Do you need help? If so, lean into your church community. Ask for prayer. You can mark stuff only in your uh, response card if you want to keep it private. Or you can reach out to me or Jacob, Devin, my wife, uh, certainly. Uh, not this, my wife, you know, not the Megan in the back with the one-week-old baby. She's busy. Um, and certainly, though, that list is not exhaustive. I'm just trying to help you get started. And any one of us can help you work through it. And if you need more guidance... Our small groups this spring covered a lot of material about how to have good conflict in the Emotionally Healthy Relationships course. And while we just, we've done it, it's easy to go back and we can review it and I can help you access it for yourself if you need it. Again, it's okay if you need mediation. It's okay if you need help. We can do conflict together. Throughout this part of our summer-long journey through 1 Corinthians, we have been considering what identifies us as the church. We serve together, we worship together, we sacrifice together. Unfortunately, the reality of life together is sometimes we bump into each other. But just as we do all of the other things together, we also do conflict together. We help one another when relationships are hard. We walk alongside one another when relationships when our, our relationships are broken. We stand up for one another. We hold one another accountable. We love one another even when it is messy. So let's do conflict together. Let's make peace. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, life is hard. Relationships are hard. Community is hard. It comes with brokenness because we are broken people. Help us to lean not out of community, to not run away from conflict, but instead to love one another by addressing those things that might otherwise cause division and disruption. Let us go to one another with our hurts and with openness about the ways we have hurt others. 
and let us do conflict together, Lord. Help us to love one another well, Lord. Help us to seek peace and wholeness in our relationships, Lord. For as Paul says, you know, you, you have placed us as stewards of your kingdom, Lord. We are capable. We have you, Lord, and your spirit and your community. We can do it. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining the Damascus Road Podcast. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God, loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. You can find out more about us online at DamascusRoadTucson.com.